Hello everyone, and welcome to Introduction to R. In this lesson, we're going to learn about logistic regression and how to run logistic regressions in R. So in the last lesson, we introduced linear regression as a predictive modeling method for estimating a numeric target variable. Now we're going to turn our attention to the classification task, which is making predictions where the outcome or our target has one of several class labels. It could be only two, in which case it's a binary classification. That is what you use logistic regression for, so that's what we're going to be dealing with in this lesson. But classification can also be extended to multiple categories using other techniques. Now logistic regression gets its name from the fact that it is built on the same basic principle as linear regression. So it's going to take a linear combination of some explanatory variables to explain some dependent variable. So for instance, in the last lesson, we had a dependent variable that was gas mileage, and we were explaining it by an intercept term plus some constant or coefficient that we were figuring out times a variable. In the case of our model that time, we used the weight of a car. Now this allows us to predict a real numbered value like gas mileage, but when we're dealing with classification, we don't want to predict a real number. We want to predict one of several classes. So a way we can apply this same sort of logic to a classification task is by passing this linear signal through a function that maps it to the range of values that we want. In the case of logistic regression, what we're going to do is pass it into the so-called logistic function, and that looks something like this. We have a function s of t, and that's equal to one divided by one plus e to the negative t, where this negative t here is this function from the linear regression model. So basically with logistic regression, what you're actually doing is you're setting this part of the linear regression equal to the log of the odds that something is going to occur. And if you rearrange the math, it turns out that it looks like that. And what happens is you end up mapping values onto what's known as a sigmoid function. So just gonna run some code here to actually plot a sigmoid function so we can take a look at it and see what it looks like. So basically what's happening when you're doing a logistic regression is you are mapping the outcome of the normal linear regression onto this function here that is constrained between zero at the bottom tail and one at the top tail. And that will constrain any inputs to this function in that range. And it just so happens that probability also ranges from zero to one. So we can interpret the output of a logistic regression model as a probability. So basically, if the output of the model is something less than zero, that will map to a probability that is less than 50%. And in that case, if we're using a 50% probability cutoff, we would say that that is a case, or we'd classify that as being the zero case. And if we got a result that was bigger than 50%, we would classify that as being a positive case because it's closer to one. Now we're not going to go any deeper into the details of the math behind how logistic regression works or how you actually go about solving the problem to optimize and find the right answer for the model because that's something R will do for you. The important thing to know is that you end up with predictions that are bounded between zero and one and can be interpreted as probabilities. And then those probabilities can be translated into predictions that are either the zero class, which is the negative class, or one, which is the positive class. So to proceed with an example of how we can do logistic regression in R, we're going to start by revisiting the Titanic disaster training data set, where we're going to be predicting whether passengers survived or not based on other features of the passengers, like their gender or age or things like that. So all this code isn't too important for you to know what it's doing. We're just loading in the data set essentially and pre-processing it using some steps that we went over in previous lessons. So that's going to get us our data set here. And we're going to impute some values as well. So let's just do that and pull up a summary. 
And you can see we've loaded in the data set and paired it down to some explanatory variables of potential interest. So what we're predicting here is survived with one being the person survived and zero being they did not survive. So this is a binary classification test because there's only two potential outcomes, one that's encoded as a zero and the other that is encoded as a one. And then we have some other variables we can use to predict with like sex, age, the passenger class and things of that nature. So creating a logistic regression model in R is very similar to how you create a normal linear regression model. Instead of LM, you use GLM, and then everything else is quite similar. We'll walk through how we do it though. We'll start with GLM for generalized linear model. And then the first thing we pass in is a formula of what we're trying to do, where the first argument to the formula is what we're trying to predict. That is the survived column, then a tilde, and then all the other variables we're going to use to predict it with. And in this case, we're just going to do a simple one explanatory variable model that's going to use the sex variable to predict survival. Then again, the second argument is going to be the data set. So our data is going to be the Titanic training data set. And you need one more argument to specify you're doing logistic regression. That's family equals binomial. That's telling it that we want to do a logistic regression. And we'll run that and pull up a summary on the model to see what kind of output we get from this. So after running a logistic regression, it shows us what the model we created was. It shows us some residuals, and then it shows us a little table here that shows the different variables, explanatory variables, and their p-values. So this helps us see whether different variables we're using were statistically significant in terms of fitting the model and whether they actually have a relation to what we're trying to predict. So this here is telling us that when the sex variable is set to male, it has a very small p-value, which means that the being male versus being female, which is the default, case or the base case for this model is extremely statistically significant at a 10 to the e to the negative 15 level so that's almost certainly something that is connected to survival and now similar to the linear regression model we can make predictions using logistic regression using the same basic steps so we can use this predict function in R. The first argument will be the model that we train. In this case, it's a logistic model this time before it was linear regression, but it works the same way pretty much. And then the new data argument again will be the data set we want to make predictions on. In this case, we're just going to make predictions on the trading data itself. And then we want to specify type equals response. This will allow the logistic regression model to return the predicted probabilities. So I'll run this to make some predictions and then create a table of those predictions against the sex variable itself. And we can see that for the female category, the model predicted all of the females to have a survival probability of about 74%. And for all of the males, it predicted a survival probability of about 18%. And if we wanted to make class predictions based on this outcome, we could say anything greater than 50%, well, that's closer to one. So for those, we'll round up and say that they are the one class, or in this case, survived. And for anything less than 50%, we'll say that is closer to zero. So we'll round those down and say that those instances are the zero class, in this case, didn't survive. So for this model, then we would say that it's predicting all the males didn't survive and all the females did survive. So if we wanted to rerun this model, including more variables than just gender, that's really easy to do. We just have to add some extra explanatory variables. So we'll show how we could do that. We're gonna do the same thing, GLM survived tilde, but in addition to sex this time, we'll add the passenger class, the passenger age, and some other things like the cabin and how many siblings they have. And we'll run everything else the same and print a summary. And we can see that in this case, we have a lot more output because there are more explanatory variables. So in this case, we have some other variables like the passenger class, the age and number of siblings also having some statistically significant results. And if we wanted to take this and make actual label predictions instead of probabilities, well, we can do that 
using an if else statement. So basically all we have to do is take our predicted probabilities and just convert everything greater than 50% to one and everything less than that to zero. And you can do that easily with if else. So if else the predicted probabilities are greater than or equal to 0.5, we'll say that's a label one, otherwise a zero. And with our predicted classes, we'll just make a table here of the predicted classes against the actual classes to see how accurate our model was. So this little table here is what's known as a confusion matrix. The confusion matrix is a common tool for assessing the results of a classification. And each cell tells us something different about how our predictions fared versus the true values. So in this bottom right corner here, this is telling us where the model predicted the positive class and the actual class was also the positive class. That is what's known as a true positive because the model got it right, so it's true, and the prediction was a positive result. And now the upper left-hand corner, this is what's known as a true negative. The model predicted a negative case, or zero, and in reality, it was a negative case. So it's called a true negative because the model got it right, it was true, and the prediction it made was the negative case. Now the true positives here, and the true negatives here, those are the cases where our model prediction actually agrees with what the real label is. That's where we got it right. But the other cells here and here, that is where our model did not agree with the actual label. So those are things we got wrong. So this cell in the bottom left hand corner, those are the false positives. They're false positives because our model predicted the positive case but it's actually wrong. So it predicted positive, but it predicted that falsely. So it's called a false positive. And then in this cell, these are called false negatives because our model predicted the negative case, but it predicted it wrong. So they are incorrect or false negatives. Now you can predict the overall model accuracy of a classification model by adding up all of the ones you got right. So that would be the true negatives and the true positives, the total of both of those, and you divide that amount by the total number of predictions in the entire table. So here we're entering those values in manually, and then we'll divide by the sum of the entire table. So this will give us the overall accuracy of the model we made on the training data. So an accuracy of almost 80% seems like it might be pretty good, but you do have to be wary of using accuracy as your metric for classification because in some cases, uh, accuracy can lead you astray because you might just be making a somewhat naive prediction that still seems like it has a high accuracy. For instance, take into consideration a very rare disease where it only occurs in 1% of the population. Well, if you came up with a test for the disease that said everybody doesn't have the disease, just by virtue of the fact that the, the disease, disease is pretty rare and only occurs 1% of the time, well, you'd expect that test to be 99% accurate because 99% of people just don't have the disease overall. So a test that just says, hey, you don't have the disease, well, that's not a test that's useful at all because it's just telling everyone you don't have the disease. It's not helping us find people that have the disease at all, even though that model actually has what seems to be quite a high accuracy at 99%. So anytime you see people talk about something in terms of its overall accuracy, you should be questioning what exactly that means because in a lot of cases, the accuracy doesn't really tell you what you think it might. So there are many other metrics you can calculate from the confusion matrix that might give you some more insight into how well the model is performing. In the case we just mentioned with a rare disease that doesn't occur very often, well, you might be interested in a different metric like the model's sensitivity, which is the proportion of the positive cases that the model actually correctly identifies as being positive. Because if you use a metric like that, well then you're actually going to focus on cases where your model is actually detecting people that have the disease. And there are many other metrics that fall out of the confusion matrix. There are kind of too many of them to really cover them all in detail. But there's a handy confusion matrix function 
built into the carrot package that we loaded in earlier when we did some data pre-processing and that can give you a bunch of those different metrics to look at so we'll give an example of doing that with the model we just made we will call confusion matrix that was loaded in when we loaded the carrot package and then we just have to pass in a factor of our class predictions for the data so we're passing that in here and then the reference argument is a factor of our target variable that is the survive column in the titanic training set and then we'll specify positive equals one that's telling it that the positive case for our application is going to be the one outcome so that was survived in our case so let's run this and you can see we are given a confusion matrix it looks pretty much the same as the one we pulled up by just making a standard table although it does show us that the reference is here and the predictions are here so that's maybe a little bit nicer than what we did because we kind of just had to know where those are a confidence interval for the accuracy of the model a p-value for the model and then a handful of other statistics that are related to the confusion matrix and a whole bunch of other factors related to the confusion matrix so kappa sensitivity we explained that one already specificity positive predictive value negative predictive value and some other things so these are all different metrics you can consider when doing classification and which ones you should consider most strongly will depend on the application and will ultimately depend somewhat on which types of cases are most important in your modeling situation for instance if you really want to avoid false positives you might be interested in different metrics that are going to take that into account more then if you're not caring so much if you have false positives and maybe you care more about false negatives or something like that so to wrap up for this lesson logistic regression is a common tool for generating class probabilities and predictions when you're dealing with binary classification although logistic regression models are often simple and may not be sufficient to fully capture relationships between explanatory variables and what you're trying to predict so they can create a good baseline you can use to compare with other more complicated models you might make later in your analysis and if you come up with some more complicated model that isn't really performing any better than a logistic regression well maybe you should just default back to the simple logistic regression model because that's generally going to be easier for you to deal with now in the next lesson we'll continue our exploration of predictive models and the classification problem by talking about decision trees which are a relatively simple model conceptually but form the basic building block for a lot of more complicated models that can perform very well on a wide range of tasks so thanks for watching and i'll see you again next time